Hi, this is Dr. Hacky Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today, all the way from San Francisco, we have Anne Lord Davin, who is going to tell you her story about all that she does and her new book and how it is being autistic herself and being a mom. And she's going to tell us about all of her adventures because she comes originally from the land of France. Welcome, Anne Laura. Well, thank you, Hacky. Thanks for being here. Let's have some fun. Start out by introducing yourself to our audience. Well, my name is Anne Laura Davin, and um, my um, my memoir, Being Seen, is um, a memoir about an autistic mother, a French immigrant, as you said, and a Zen student. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, we may have trouble communicating because you have a French accent and I'm from Jersey City originally. Ah. So I don't know if you can understand me. So, uh, you know. Oh, I, yeah, I hear some accent there. Indeed. Now, you are a real student of Zen meditation, aren't you? Yes, I would say that. How did you get into that? So, 15 years ago, I came to California from Chicago. And that's when I landed at Green Gulch Farm, which is a Zen center, a little bit like a monastery. I was searching for, you know, what was going on with me. So, I, meditation sounded like something that might be a good idea, and indeed it is. I can't tell you how it has helped my life. I am alive, I think, because of that, you know. So. Now, let's go back a little bit further. You grew up in France. You were autistic, but you didn't know it. You didn't know it. You didn't get diagnosed till you were 46, even though you look younger than 46 now. Oh, well, thank but, you. How oh, kind. Now... <laughs> What was it like growing up with autism and nobody knew you had autism? What was the story? Well, it was difficult, very difficult. I, I, I'm lucky because my, one of my, I had several passions as I grew up, very you know, autistic-like passions. And I'm really fortunate that my father who I suspect was himself on the autism spectrum, gave me one of his passions, and that's a skill, that's tennis. So when I grew up, I became very skilled in tennis, which was kind of a barrier, if I may say, between people, you know, thinking I was very odd and crazy and wanted to, you know, put me away, but also was very good in tennis, so... You know, well, you it, were so good in tennis, you were in the French Open, is that correct? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, that is correct. However, I have to tell you the truth is it was a one-time thing at the preliminary, and I was very quickly beaten 6-0, six, 6-0. Zero, six, zero. So <laughs> <laughs> this is just to say, you know, that I played tennis. <laughs> now, what were your autistic characteristics, you might say, then, that you no longer exhibit now, if there are any? Well, I still exhibit a lot of them if you dig down. I mean, the thing is, I feel like there's like a certain age, uh, there's like hormones kicking. So for example, I was very passionate indeed with certain things, like very focused and, um, you know, I was a child. Um, I, I don't think that any really disappeared. Okay, no, that's not true. I had some stimming habits, like with my thumb, that I never do. That is true anymore. Also, let's face it, I was not yet understanding all the... The sensory stuff obviously bothered me very much, but I was not so understanding that it was a big problem for me. So, for example, my dad would wear uh, cologne once from time to time, not very often. But when he did, I sure noticed it. But, you know, I was a child and it was different and I thought I liked it. In fact, I know better now. I know that those smells 
just make give me terrible headaches and I don't like them at all. But I didn't know then that at the time. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. The hypersenses, uh, which, you know, uh, most people are ignorant that people whose brains are a little bit different, whatever their labels might be, but let's take the autism label. Uh, I did not know that my daughter, Rebecca, who I didn't know she had Asperger's, and I didn't know that all of her senses were hyper. So I used to thought I would get her attention by talking loudly, ah. not knowing I was driving her crazy. Right. And I didn't know that certain sense, certain touch, feel, lights, right. And, of course, she has epilepsy, too, so the lights were a big problem. I didn't know when I took her into a public supermarket that she could mm -hmm. hear the fluorescence and see them flickering and drive them drive her crazy. And then there's the movement, too. You know, I also, at that age, got some epilepsy, too, when I was a teenager. Well, yeah, I, you probably think I'm very different. Many, no, I've, no, I, 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 you see, the way I'm seeing neurodiversity... I'm seeing that the whole of neurodiversity of different brains is greater than the sum of its parts. I don't see anything occurring in isolation. And it's precisely because I'm a novice who's new at this, accidentally getting into this, that I'm able to connect all the dots and say, wait a minute, nobody is strictly autistic or strictly epileptic or strictly anxious or strictly PTSD. They all overlap. And the right. actual right. anatomical wiring in our brains is different. So that's why I named our, our company and our website Different Brains, differentbrains.com, because I don't want to alienate anyone. I want everyone to feel welcome. And labels are okay if they help us do something. But I'm not a big fan of them because everything overlaps. And uh, I if uh, I love the saying that when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Now, yeah. let's take you. You're about as individual as you get, okay? I think <laughs> if we look up in the dictionary, let's find somebody with autism who played in the French Open, who came here from France, and then worked in the very violent areas of Chicago we'll get into in a minute. Then ended up in San Francisco. Yeah. Tell us about the job you had teaching in the south side of Chicago. Let's go back there. Yeah, that was quite something, I'll tell you. So first I want to say that uh, my I'm, I'm quite autistic with my job history in many ways, meaning it's very spotty. I never had uh, jobs that lasted more than maybe a year and a half. I mean, not that I was ever fired, but they always found reasons, you know. I, I guess I was odd. <laughs> so when I was in Chicago, so I ended up with often difficult stuff. Uh, and uh, sure enough, I ended up teaching on the uh, south side of Chicago. And boy, well, it was something to find other people who had a really, really tough time too, you know, who were very different and had a you know, significant challenges. I mean, the I, I just feel for the kids that I saw, it was just, some teachers would say that I would be too, um, you know, I, I would buy too much into it. But, you know, maybe on some levels, just I, I, I did, I acted a different way. However, I... I mean, the stories that those kids told me, okay, maybe some of them were made up, but let me tell you, not all of them were. No, <laughs> Many of them. And, you know, we interviewed Jim Sporleader, um, who uh, went into the schools, a, a very, very tough school out in Washington, and, and thought he was going to put in law and order and everything. And he evolved into the trauma-informed method, where he would say to the kid, Tell me why, what happened? Tell me what happened. Why are you acting like this? Tell me what's going on. And he'd get an earful. And it's not an excuse or anything, but it's a way of approaching the problem. And we see that in the, um, at the Hacky Reitman Boys and Girls Club here in Fort Lauderdale um, at Martin Luther King and Broward Boulevard. And uh, these kids are good kids who come there mm. who 
don't have parents for the most part. Uh, many of them don't even have one parent. And um, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And we're very proud. We have a 90% high school graduation rate and the kids do well. But we have to, we have to, uh, the kids who want to be the gangbangers and not leave their beepers and not give up their colors, we have to not bring them in the mix, you know, which you don't have that option in a, a public school. And uh, I'm getting off at a tangent because now let's shift from teaching in the south side of Chicago with undiagnosed autism, and now you move out to San Francisco. What was that change like? Oh, gosh, that was the best for me. I really feel like I arrived, you know, to like a somewhat safe harbor. I I mean, I was becoming more and more ill. Um, I, I told you, if I feel like it's a hormonal thing. The, in my book, I talk about the phases the, the, that one goes through when I feel one is autistic. There are like phases. If you make it through teenager years, I feel, oh, wow, that's that's a good one. And then then you're going to have your uh, adult life and then you're going to get premenopausal, which is what was coming on me at that time. And hacky. The sensory things became worse and worse. My sensory problems, I mean, everything started to be very difficult for me more and more. So when I arrived in California, I was trying to figure what to do, what was going on with this. And so, like I told you, I went to sit for six months uh, at that Green Gosh uh, farm, uh, which is Soto Zen which uh, required a lot of um, sitting. Uh, uh, and um, it's basically, at the time, it's like you got to have faith. I saw people who have been doing for a long time, who have been practicing Zen, Soto Zen for a long time. And that gave me faith because obviously it has an effect. And so that was the only thing that made sense for me because I could sit uh, even when I left Green Gulch, I could I could do it at home. It did not cost any money because I had big financial problem. It did not require many sensory thing because at least I was at home and I could keep it dark and I could keep it quiet. Depending of well, when it's not all that quiet, you know. Some when I was like this, even inside my apartment, all the you know noise, background noise, I would hear them very much. But you know, I have often earplugs and I have a whole uh, set of headgear <laughs> but I kept sitting I kept sitting I kept sitting hacky and um, first you know a little bit every day and more and more and more and guess what my life slowly came back on track you know everything I feel stemmed from there does that make sense you have all the sense in the world it really does that the Zen meditation was for you what I refer to as a chapter in Asper Tools. That was your safe place. Mm -hmm. That was a safe place. It was my refuge, yes. And yes. you were relaxed and you would sit and you would clear your head and you would keep the sensory intake to a minimum. Correct. Did you play any soothing music or anything like that? Oh, no. At that time, Hacky. Silence. Hacky thing. Even soothing music was too much at that time. Okay, now, I was. How did you get diagnosed with autism? Okay, well, actually, um, believe it or not, a lot of my Zen friends helped. Um, eventually, okay, so I have a son. <laughs> That's a very important. I don't know if I mentioned that. <laughs> who is now twenty four. And um, when I was becoming so very ill, it became impossible to take care of him. So he left uh, and uh, I um, started to be able to have more. I w at that time, I no longer had much strength, really. I mean, I was ill. I was really in bad shape. I could not go out. and But because my son left, that kind of helped 
me have some room for like more because I have a physical problem in my neck and spine. So when I was alone at home, I could massage it and do various, you know, therapy and stretches for it. So that started to help. Also, my Zen, I they always gave me scholarships. Ah, that allowed me to go sometimes to their event where it was very difficult with the noise and everything, but they couldn't, would not understand, for example, why I needed a room by myself. I mean, I was not diagnosed yet. So anyway, because of my son too, I, I, I had welfare. And welfare did not believe me either. Nobody did. However, one time I fainted in front of a caseworker. So they smelled a rat and they decided, okay, we're going to help you. I mean, so the, med- the traditional medical clinic did not, could not figure out what was going on either. But thanks to welfare, I was able to um, re- start to receive the um, social security. Eventually, though, with social security, two years later, you're automatically enrolled in... Um, Medicare? Is it? Medi- yeah, Medicare. And when you have Medicare, you can actually see specialists. And what happened was then a friend of mine took me to see a very good neurologist. And there I was diagnosed. So from then on, everything changed. Tell us about your son and your first husband back then. Yeah. What were the, what were the circumstances of all that? Because you were autistic, you didn't know it, you were having issues... And you got married, uh, or, yeah. or not? I don't know. Did yeah, you I, I was married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for and, a few years. <laughs> and then, so he got custody of your son at that time. Actually, it was we got joint custody. However, what happened indeed is I had to leave my son with uh, his father when I came to California. For the first three years I was in California, I did not have my son. Having a child for an autistic person is very, very, very difficult. The sensory things, I mean, once my child was born, the screaming, the, you know, the smells, <laughs> it got, I mean, I love having a son. On the other hand, listen, I did not kill myself because I had a son, you know, that was a very strong anchor. And I love my son to no end, just, you know, autistic, non-autistic, it's the same, okay? I mean, uh, but, but um, I, I just had to um, leave him with his father when I came here in 2000 and, uh, in 1999, September 1999, yeah. Now, are you, are you on good relationship terms with your son now? Yes. Oh, yes. He doesn't live far from here, Martin. Yes, he's. Yes, we are on good relationship terms. We we see one another quite regularly, and we do things like, I uh, he moves around a lot, so I get his mail, you know. <laughs> so I have to tell him a lot about it, and I helped him. I help him a lot with his mail to taking care of it, and so, so yeah. What, what does he do? Oh, that's a good question. What does he do? <laughs> And is, I he, think, is he, does he have autistic traits? Well, I would definitely say so. But he doesn't identify with it. He doesn't want to. And you know, Haki, I totally understand this. Totally. You say you have a daughter and, you know, like you say, being labeled is difficult. You know, I mean, once you're labeled, uh, you get into a lot of people who right away assume they're better than you and... <sighs> It's and, and then there's the financial aspect. I mean, when you go for a job, it's a tough one. You know, if you tell if you tell your uh, the job person, uh, you know, that you're autistic, it's getting better. Hacky. The assumption, obviously, there are people, many autistic self advocate like me who are coming out and telling the world, hey, we're not such morons, you know. <laughs> but it's a hard one. OK, no, it is. And what I want is for the educational system and the employers to just uh, be able to say, look, we're glad to give you a little bit of help you need or an accommodation because you have valuable gifts and you have valuable talents. And that can be at any level. That could be for out where you are in San Francisco for Google or Microsoft or Apple or someone who works on an assembly line and loves paying to detail doing the same thing over and over, whatever Whatever the job is, and I think we all need to be able to um, 
try to get a job and maximize our independence. Oh, yes. I'm totally with you. Totally with you. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole financial job thing is so vital. I mean, without that, can't function, you know. Could be you, could be me, could be anybody. You know, we need to be able to function. Now, tell us, how did you, how did you uh, get into writing your book? Tell us about that, being seen. Yes, being seen. So... When I arrived to California 16 years ago, I became, as I said, more and more ill and unable to function. And I wanted to talk about what was going on with me to people, but then people didn't want to hear it. And some, some of them, two of my Zen friends, totally in different ways, told me, you know, you should write it down. So I started to write it down. And that's how my book started. Very good. How would you uh, describe your book to give a teaser to our viewers and listeners? Yes. So, well, I decided to go at it the chronological order. I didn't want to jump around. And, I mean, I'm fortunate in that I, there is, like, obviously three different parts in my life, even geographically. So I followed those. So the first part of my book is in France, 23 years. Then the middle part of my book is in Chicago, 12 years. And then the last part of my book is in California. Nice. Okay, so it's got a chronological and a geographic path. Yes. Okay, well, we'll have to read it to... Uh to see you because after all it's being seen so we're going to get to see you when we read that book yes thank you. that's exactly the idea i mean it's not so much to be seen again as autistic but for all of us to be better seen to be better understood and respected now do you ever get back to france uh, well, I recently started, I did not go for a long time there when I was very ill, I just couldn't. So for 14 years, I did not go. But the past few years, yes, I have gone back and I am going to go back uh, in the fall of 2016 coming up. France, when I grew up, and even now, uh, I, honestly, Haki, I got, uh, finally people were like, oh yeah, she's saying the truth. France was terrible for autistic people. And, uh, you know, even now, France does not have a very good reputation when it comes to autism. But I want to say that uh, during our visit in 2014, uh, my partner Greg and I uh, did a lot of uh, visited a lot of autism places um, as much as we could and we found that um, you know there is hope that obviously France is trying to catch up with the whole thing and that there is very much hope with that. We have different brains all over the world for sure. <laughs> That's very true. Especially <laughs> out there in San Francisco. Silicon Valley. Right <laughs> where you are. You in Florida. Come you and on. Greg fit right in there. And I'm sure Greg's a whole nother story, but we'll do that for a, we'll save yep. that for another <laughs> time. What is the biggest advice you might have for someone experienced problems in their adult life with autism? What is your advice from Anlor Davin to say to somebody, what would that advice be? This is a tough question because I feel like there is no one thing, you know, it's many things. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound like a proselytizer, but I feel like for everybody, there's, for everybody, you know, not just autistic people, Zen practice is really something wonderful. All right, if someone wants to, someone watches you just saying that, and says, you know what, I want to try that Zen no matter what. I don't even know what it is, but I want to try that. How do they go about that? Well, in uh, many cities, uh, more and more, there are uh, places where people get together, little sanghas, 
where people sit. I mean, but you don't have to go in a sangha at first. You can also start sitting by yourself in a quiet place, cross-legged or however you can, but with the back um, upright and being still, being still for for as long as you can be because it's it's not magic, you know. Every terrible thing that we push away is going to come back up, okay? And it's really, really tough. It's like water that has dirt in it that's really starting to come down the dirt at first. Ah, so keep at it. Just stay quiet. That's, is that okay? Can I answer your question? Yes, it is. And it sounds for myself... That last part would be a challenge, being quiet. Um, now, how does our audience find out more about you? How do they do that? Yes, I would, uh, that's important. I have a website, and that website is anlorddaven.com. Let me spell it. A-N-L-O-R-D-A-V-I-N.com. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll go to your, your website, anlordavin.com, and they can find all the information and about your, your new book, Being Seen, okay? And uh, something about Zen meditation there? Oh, yes. Good. Oh, yes. I mean, that's what informs my book. Okay. So there is a little video, too, a, a four-minute video on which I am portrayed while sitting. Okay. So... Yeah, oh yeah. Amlor, it's been just terrific. Thank you very much. Another episode here, Dr. Hackey Reitman, Exploring Different Brains. And thank you thank very much. Thank you to Hackey. It has been a pleasure too. Very good. Thank you. We've been speaking here with Amlor Davin with her new book, Being Seen. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.